It is good to be here this morning. I tell you, let me allow me to bring greetings from CBOQ to you, from our president, Ev Borum, and from our new executive minister, Leanne Friesen. Uh, this has been a special uh, family. Uh, when I joined in with CBOQ almost 13 years ago, uh, there were many families here connected uh, to Kingsway that made me feel welcome. It was uh, coming home to this tribe that I had grown up in. Uh, I'm excited when I see the likes of Kingsway present at our most recent avalanche uh, retreat, uh, the youth that are going to be coming up on our blizzard retreat, uh, the leadership that you have uh, in Kyle, uh, and the incredible uh, volunteer leaders that come alongside her to invest into the lives of youth uh, is an encouragement. I so appreciate uh, her leadership from the side of youth, from my seat as well as uh, within Camp Kwasan, I want to say thank you. I thank you for your investment into Camp Kwasan uh, over many years. I want to let you know that this is a partnership that we share in together. And as we've seen over the last number of years, and even just this last year, 256 kids gave their lives to Jesus for the first time. We surpassed over 1,200 campers hearing about the gospel. Uh, this is an extension of your ministry as you invest into the next generation, and it's a joy to be in partnership with you and to be invited uh, to share with you uh, this morning. Uh, I take great joy to see what is beginning to happen here uh, within the youth ministry. The blessing that uh, Kingsway is, as you guys are on the cusp of a new chapter, the excitement of rolling in of a new pastor, and what this will mean and what is on the edge for you. I want you to know that you are strategically placed right here on this property here in Toronto. This is a unique place. Land we see throughout Scripture is precious, and it's set apart. And this place has been set apart, and you have this strategic place to impact and bless the next generation in this city. On behalf of CBQ, let me say that we are glad that you're part of our 300 plus churches seeking to help the next generation and all generations move closer to Jesus. As we jump into today, I want to ask you these two questions. First, do you both individually and as a church community want to be people of influence or will you be the influenced? That's question one. Question two, will you be a people of faith that will reach and influence the next generation, or will they disappear from your church? Two critical questions for us to answer. To answer both of these questions, you have to know that you need to make a choice about how you are going to live in relation to Max Q. Because how you're willing to go into Max Q and how effective you're going to be at reaching the next generation is going to be about how well you prepare them for engaging with Max Q. It will be the difference maker for the future, for the now and right now, and what is to come. You might be asking me, well, what is Max Q? That's a really good question to be asking in light of where we're going to be going. You've got to get this point. Don't tune out right now. Know what Max Q is, or a whole lot doesn't make sense going forward from here. I got to tell you, just recently, uh, I had a chance to go to take uh, my family uh, to, uh, to the Kennedy Space Center. So this is term, Max Q is really important there. Max Q is actually a term in space. Max Q is maximum dynamic pressure. Here's the deal, why this is going to relate to today, why it's so important, is that for nearly two years, NASA remained grounded after the horrific accident that occurred as the space shuttle Columbia. You see, NASA's greatest fear exists in max Q, this maximum dynamic pressure. This is the place where the increasing speed meets decreasing density. It's the reality that's where the Earth's atmosphere meets up against space atmosphere. You know those points when you watch the space movies and the, like, the shuttle all starts shaking, it gets really red and heated up, and it's like just chaos like that, and that's that, that intensity, that heat, that, the bolts are shaking already, that is max Q. Two 
opposing atmospheres meeting up against each other and how you navigate it, how you are situated as the shuttle, how you are built for that moment determines whether you're going to be able to make your mission effective, make it into space or not. That point of max Q is one of the most critical points and it's the most stressful points for NASA as they face. If we're going to see impact with the gospel message in our lives, in the lives of the next generation, and in our communities, we need to enter to max Q in our world. We need to be prepared and willing to go where our Christian worldview, our Christian atmosphere meets the world's view, the world's atmosphere. We need to be able to live in the tension and the pressure that is our max Q in order to reach, disciple, and influence the next generation. Each one of us needs to be a people equipped to share with the next generation the ways of the Lord so that they're not afraid or rejecting of the world, but that they're able to prepare to engage in a meaningful way the values of redemptive, a grace-filled attitude as they live out Jesus to all the world around them. You see, friends, that Max Q, our Max Q as followers of Jesus, is experienced living our lives in a place where the biblical worldview and values collides with the values of the rest of the world. They say every text that you send, every job you're serving in, the school where you're attending, the places where you interact or have peers, each one of those is your moments of max Q. Max Q could occur with every person you interact with, with every road that you drive down, with every Tim Hortons drive through that you go through, every event you run, or how you respond to the critical issues of our day. Friends, let's not run away from Max Q, but see it as an awesome place to be able to live in. The life of a Christ follower is not something boring, it's not something routine, it's not something passive. At least it shouldn't be. It's an adventure. It's dynamic. It's challenging. It's a struggle. And it's life to the fullest. The life of a Christ follower is, is welcoming us into this life of influence. Being able to navigate our max Q. Right now, each one of us in this room, young and old, can either be influenced or be the influencer. Get passionate about who you are who God created you to be and what you are living for. Before we go much further, I want to dive into John at chapter 17. I know we read Psalm 78, and we're going to get to that. But John 17, verses 13 to 19 says this, Jesus, in prayer with his Father, said, I am coming to you now, but I say to you, I say to you these things while I'm still in this world, so that they may have the full measure the full measure of the joy within them. It goes on through verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world, and more than that, I am of the world, than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctified myself, and they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus has called us to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus actually called us right here to step right in to the world of Max Q. He recognizes that it's going to be tough. He recognizes that it's not easy, but as followers of Jesus, we will be misunderstood, we'll be rejected, but be present with us. You see, we have the greatest message of hope of love, of redemption, of service, and grace. Do you see it there? Right in the scriptures, God is saying, live the life that you've been given in Max Q. Live in pointing others to the hope of Jesus as you navigate that challenging space where everything just seems to be getting rocked, but that you are building up the next generation and that you to yourself are building so that you can be strong in the midst of this space of Max Q. We are called by God to live where we are interacting with the world through active connection. Where we are engaging with the world with compassionate truth 
and restorative forgiveness, where we are loving and serving the needs of our world, which will have us living differently, thinking differently, acting differently. John 17 tells us that bringing the heart of Jesus right into Max Q knows that Jesus is giving you the truth in order to navigate Max Q with grace and to be intentional that Jesus has sent you into Max Q, that you are not going in alone, but you're going in because he has given you a mission and a purpose. He has prepared you and has promised the protection and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, in that way, we've been invited by the creator of the universe to be an influencer, to make a difference in this world, to not leave it the same. He invites us into this dynamic life that we found here. But friends, when did we as the church lose this? When did it happen that we got afraid of Max Q and felt it best to stay grounded rather than pursue the mission, to hide out in the church, to lack friendships with those far from God? Why do we shy away from the world and hide in our Christian bubbles? Why do we get comfortable in our Christian friend zones? Why do we make church a hideout, an inward focus, instead of a place of positively influence, influencing the entire community around us and beyond? Moreover, as a church, we know that we're losing our young people because we're not being the church that's sharing life with our young people by being part of their everyday experiences and helping them know what it is to navigate the world of Max Q they find themselves in every day. We need to realize that we need to be with them to help navigate them, to mentor them, to coach them, to be present in their lives, not just on a Sunday or not just on a Wednesday or a Friday, but part of their day-to-day -day life, both virtually, digitally, practically, physically, sharing life with them if they're going to make it through Max Q. Yes, we can be the influencers in our world, and in the midst of Max Q, are we willing to take the risk and prioritize the time that it will take to actually invest and share life with the next generation, or are we simply going to say, Kylie, that's your role, and you do that, and hopefully they'll come out at 18? Or will each one of us go, actually, that's our role. Yes, there's those that have a greater priority to focus on the next gen, but actually say, that actually, that's all of our role. If we actually want to engage in this, the church, to be influencers in the community. They were saying, I gotta prioritize my schedule. I've gotta look at my calendar. I've gotta look at what it's gonna take to actually invest my life into the life of the next generation for the sake of helping them see what it is to live where the two worlds of our biblical values and the world values collide and say, this is how we're gonna help navigate that together. Did you know that that's actually a biblical mandate? that we as the church are to invest and mentor the next generation, that mandate was given to us by God, not just for the volunteers, and I can see some of them back there that pour their lives into the next generation, or kidsmen leaders, or those who like teenagers. With next gen it's actually a calling for all of us. Psalm 78, Verse 5 says, For he issues his laws to Jacob, he gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation will set its hope new on God. This actually is the model of mentoring that's passing along. We're showing us how it's lived out. It's not just spoken at, but it's shared with and lived out. And I see how that makes sense in the world around me. That's what the next generation needs. It's what we each need. There was a major research piece done in 2012 called Hemorrhaging Faith. This piece spoke about what was happening to Canadian youth, asking why they were leaving the church or returning. They declared that only one in four youth had grown up in the church would still be connected with the church and their faith by the time they were 20. Interesting thing, 80% of those that would stay connected to the church had experience in missions, in camp, in retreats. Uh, they had people that were actually actively involved as mentors in their life in very practical settings. As we remember the words of the psalmist who has called you and me to invest in the next generation, uh, what's going to stop the hemorrhaging of young people from our church? Well, we'll see Generation Z and Generation Alpha 
who have never stepped, yet stepped foot in the church begin to encounter Jesus? What's it going to be for youth, those here in this room, and their peers to be able to stay strong in the faith as they live most of their life in the pressure of Max Q? Well, we just heard it. It's Psalm 78, 1 to 7. The idea of passing on the ways of the Lord to the next generation. That I'm going to invest my life of walking with you so you can see what it's like. How is it like as an accountant to live out life as Jesus in and amongst the world, as a lawyer, as a business person, as a market in the marketplace, uh, as, as an, in, in the world of NGOs, as in the world of nonprofits? What does that look like to live it out day, out, day in and day out? What does it look like to live it out in, in our marriages? What does it look like to live it out with our peers? What's going to happen when the next generation sees it lived out in you? They can't just hear you tell you, here's the best game plan to do it. Like, show me how you prioritize Jesus, how you live out Jesus, how you choose to follow Jesus. What does it actually look like to be a follower of Jesus? And it becomes alive. You see, to navigate Max Q is not something that we go out alone. It involves preparation, support, encouragement, prayer, and modeling. You see, each one of us invest into the next generation takes on the responsibility to invest into someone. It isn't how do I reach the thousands. Each one of us, how do I reach the one? How am I committed to investing into the one? If each one of us took the time to invest into the one and walk with them in the ways of the Lord, we see around a transformation, a sense of belonging, a sense of understanding, a sense of, of a safe place to ask questions that don't make sense, a sense of someone who's going to walk with me to help me understand the cultural issues of our day that we're trying to navigate through. Someone who's been there before, someone who's wrestled with doubts and rejection, has often walked away from Jesus and then has come back. That's what's going to make a difference in the life of a young person. Uh, not giving them three points in a poem doesn't make everything all okay. And Oh, that's why I'm going to follow Jesus. They're going to say, it's real. It's life-changing. I want to encounter what you have. Walk with me. Allow me to get a little personal here with this. What kept me connected to the faith was a man named Andrew. I don't know where I'd be in my faith journey if it wasn't when I was 12 years old that there was a guy named Andrew. He was a lawyer by trade. He happened to be a youth leader. He happened to really love the maple leaves. And I'll let you guys know, the maple leaves are not losers. One thing I learned with Andrew is that they're just a team that, be is a team that believes in widespread greatness. Uh, see, there's things that mentors teach you along the way of how to navigate those hard points in life. Uh, but Andrew took time with me. Uh, we did Leaf Games together. We did Tim Hortons together. We did dev devotionals at lunch once a week. This is important because we learned that mentoring through a renegotiating faith survey research piece done was that mentoring is one of the number one things that helped a young person stay with Jesus. They need to have, their parents have a vibrant faith was helpful. Them experiencing God through camp or retreat missions, we talked about that is important. But having that mentor was life changing. What does that mean in our lives to prioritize Psalm 78 to live that out? As Kingsway Baptist Church, when you look together at Psalm 78, what does it look like to collectively invest into the next generation, to train them up, to not just have those with the title of youth leader or kidsman leader or youth pastor, but to personalize it? I do believe there's a role that the parents are critical in playing, but I believe that is actually the role of the entire church. And the church to look in and around itself and beyond its walls and go, who's on their way to Jesus and they may not even know it yet? How do I use that in my workplace to invest into the next generation so that they can see what life is like with Jesus? Young adults here, young professionals, youth, the next generation is you, but it's also the children who are, who are, uh, who are not yet adults on their way that you're called to invest into them. You are to begin right now point children in a relationship with Jesus, to walk with them, to walk with your peers. 
We know that from the time of the nation of Israel choosing to follow God, that each person following has been given this mandate to reach the next generation and pass it on to the next generation so that they in turn will pass it on to the next generation. I know that we as the church all too often looked at all the things that we're not supposed to do and say that's sinful, it's missing the mark of what God's doing. And we spend a lot of time focusing on all the things that we're not supposed to do because it's not of God. But when we also choose to not do the things that we're called to do by Scripture, such as invest into the lives of the next generation, then we also walk in sin because we also miss the mark of what God has called us to do. Those are the more challenging things. We often avoid the things we're told not to do. I can do all of it. We can do that. But actually, am I actually obedient to Scripture when it says actually God's given us a mandate to mentor the next generation and I'm being obedient to that too? And how is that being shown in my life? There's a church I recently came across and amidst a lot of their own shortcomings, they do clearly articulate regularly to the church that one of their key goals is to have a majority of their adults know and love the children and youth in their congregation and in their community and pointing them to Jesus. This, my friends, is not a ministry strategy. It's a theological foundation for who the church is called to be. So as we've read, and I encourage you to sit over this week on Psalm 78, 1 to 7, we need to hear the calling that ministry with youth and children isn't for the few, but that each of us are responsible for giving our lives to invest into the lives of the next generation. Those might be your grandchildren. That might be someone that works on your team in the firm that you're part of. It might be someone in this church. It might be some of those youth that are in and amongst the community of this church that are crying out, that are accessing kids' help phone line, that are accessing the food banks. They simply need someone to walk with them. It might be tutoring. It might be checking in with local schools in your area and to go, what can I offer in my skill set to begin to invest in the next generation? Youth and young adults want to grow in understanding and reliance on Christ, but they're not interested in a list of tasks of disciplines or simply doctrines. They need people to walk alongside them for their, the safe faith development. Mark 3, 14, Jesus simply told his disciples, be, he wanted to be with them. That be with factor trumps any programs we've got. What is it to value the be with factor? How am I going to be with people? Be with the next generation. How am I going to continue? And I've got to tell you, the more you act as a mentor to the next generation, the deeper you grow in your own spiritual life. When I know that there's eyes watching me way more, I'll tell you, it became that way as a dad. Grace, and I also eyes are on me a lot more. I'm like, wow, I've got to go deeper in my faith because I've got eyes on me. We'll actually grow deeper in our own walk with Jesus when we have others that we're mentoring who are looking to us to help us understand as we go through it. The church is not the place where we drop off the next generation and hope the church leaders do a good job. Rather, as parents, as spiritual parents to youth who don't have a Christian home and grandparents, we all speak into the lives of children and lead them in the ways of the Lord. And we need to see the church and that the church leadership is of support to that which we own collectively. Youth here, I want you to hear this. Those in your teen and early young adult years, this calling is for you too. You need to invest into the next generation now. You need to listen to their stories. You need to know their, help, uh, help them know their Bible, to share your experiences with them. You need to not judge or be holier than thou, but instead be full of grace and find even just one younger person whom you can pray for, read the Bible with and share life together with. What will it look like to engage the next generations and the ones that follow? It's simple. First, we need to have an adult in the church, every adult in the church, sharing life or mentoring a younger person. The church needs to have, uh, to give youth a chance to lead. Much of what, many of what you're doing here. And we need to encourage and support parents in having a vibrant faith with their kids. As we do this, you reflect back on John 17. 
in this individualistic, consumer-driven Western world, we have the chance to counter this with a selfless service of others out of the love that Jesus has first given to us. Let us not be fearful of the world. Let us not have the world influence, influence us, but let's be the influencers. But we influence not with power, not with title. We influence with love. We influence with grace. We influence with the person and message of Jesus to our world. That we're unafraid of to step into the point of Max Q in our world. Because we know that the Holy Spirit will walk with us and give us wisdom. That we are able to walk in truth and restorative forgiveness. We're able to know that God has given us a purpose to step into that. So as I close, let me leave you with this challenge. That you take some time this week to go over Psalm 78, John chapter 17. Ask God to search your heart to see where he, what he is saying about investing into the next generation. Ask how am I fulfilling this calling and mandate that he has given to me. I want you to think of how you can be on mission with Jesus, committed to sharing life with someone of the next generation, joining others and learning from one another here to how you together, how we can best navigate our max Q and to be influencers instead of the influence and see that the next generation will know the ways of Jesus who will pass on to the next generation who will pass on to those who are not yet born. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you as creator God looked at each one of us and said, I want to be in this with you. You've given us a voice. You've asked us to not just be passive and just sit and let the world pass us by, but that we have purpose and meaning. And you've invited us to join you on mission and helping others understand the greatest love, joy, and redemptive story that's possible found through your son, and that we can share that to the world. In your name, amen.